In this video, I'm going to cover the auto adjustment plugin for Panasonic's Geometry Manager Pro projector control software. There are two types of licenses you can activate. You can activate only a projector, a single one or two. This could be cheaper, but you can only utilize the auto warp on just those two projectors. And you can control it from any laptop that has Geometry Manager Pro. If you activate a controlled laptop, you'll be able to control as many projectors that it's capable of, even though they're not activated, as long as those projectors have the features and are new enough to be used with the Auto Warp plugin. Let's jump into the demonstration. I have Geometry Manager Pro opened up, and at the top right, you can see the Auto Adjust button. The first option is letting the camera and the auto adjustment do everything. Geometry, edge blending, color matching, white level, black level. You don't always want to do everything at once, especially if you're in a dynamic environment like live events or rents on staging. So it may be good for you to do only the geometry and edge blending and wait until the environment is more controllable to then use the system to do color matching, white balance, and black level. Being a demonstration, let's go with the full package. On this page, we search for the camera, and we can see in this box any that have been found. Camera search. I'm connected to a USB camera, so we'll go ahead and find that. But if I wanted to connect to a network camera, we could type in the IP address or a range of IP addresses for the software to look out and find. The only consumer grade cameras that are compatible with this software is the Nikon D5000 series. If you have Panasonic cameras, for example, Robocams like the HE-130, you can utilize those through the network interface to work with the auto adjustment plugin. So let's search for cameras. Here I found my Nikon D5300. Let's grab it. We now have it in the software. and Let's move forward. This page is asking us for the orientation or the physical setup of our projectors. I'm doing a two projector blend, so I'll tell it I have a width of two. It can auto blend and warp vertically, horizontally, and also multiple stacks of projectors. I'll refer you to the user manual for its full capabilities. Here we can see which projectors that we want to utilize this on. Potentially we could have a whole bunch of projectors on our network or in our show, but we're only warping two or three at a time. So make sure you select the correct projectors when you're doing this. As you can see, it's putting an identification on this screen. I'm telling it what the order the projectors are in. I can undo this. I can re-identify and reset. For black level, it gives us three options. Set temporary values, use the current settings that are in the software or the projectors, and adjust using the camera dark environment is necessary. My environment isn't the darkest. I am in a room, but I've got some drapes and curtains that are letting some amount of light through. But let's go ahead and use it and see how it comes out. It will add a good amount of time to the process though. So this is the setup screen for the camera itself. If you know white balance, shutter speed, ISO, and f-stop, and the functions of the camera, you can manually dial in the camera so it has the cleanest and most crisp view of your screen or you can press auto setup and let the software set the camera up for you. You only have to do this once and then the settings are persistent in the camera. So if you go to do other projectors, you could just leave the camera at those same settings. But it doesn't take that long, so I would say go ahead and auto set up every time you use it. Once it's done, we'll see a view from the camera's perspective and that'll help us decide if the camera is positioned properly. And from there, make adjustments with the camera or the settings. There you have it. It can see our entire surface. Notice I'm off axes. I'm not shooting directly at this. You don't have to shoot directly at the screen perfectly. I don't know to the extent that you have to be on angle and with a clear view. Of course, the better you can set up your camera, the better job it's going to be able to do. 
but for this application being off axis it should still give us a very good warp on that wall. There's a live view option where in real time you can see what the camera sees. This is a very good feature that allows you to see the perspective of the camera and whether you're talking to a technician who's manually adjusting the camera or you're doing it via a control interface through the network this lets you set the camera up just like you need it in terms of positioning. You could also have multiple cameras here as well. I could redo another test shot and view a larger image here. Picture gamma is 2.2. I wouldn't recommend changing this. So on this page, as you can see, each of these cursors are on our surface. So what we're doing is telling the software where the physical boundaries of our screen is. You can use the keyboard. It does small jumps and you can use the mouse as well. So that's pretty accurate. We can do a flat screen, horizontal curve, vertical curve, or spherical shape. Now, if you choose a different shape, you're going to need more than four points. So you can increase the amount of cursors for your horizontal or your vertical. This lets you tell the software more specifically the shape of your screen. Once again, I can go to the live view, make sure my camera is still seeing everything correctly. Now the margin setting, what this is for is the software only really works off of the 1610 native aspect ratio of the chip and the internal test patterns. So if you're sending 16.9 content, it's going to warp everything too far. So when you're utilizing a 16 by 9 signal, you turn the margin on to compensate for that so that way it doesn't warp too far. And if you're doing other aspect ratios, you can come in here and manually adjust all of this, but this is the proper letterbox masking already. For edge blending the projectors, we can manually set the overlap or check auto and let the camera and system do it. I've been having problems with the auto. It keeps giving me the exact same overlap of 672, regardless of how I set up my projectors. I'm not sure why it's doing this, but we can utilize the manual, no problem. So I'm gonna type in the overlap that I'm utilizing in my software. Let's start. We're gonna get a couple prompts along the way. So you just can't walk off yet. But what it's going to do is throw up a series of test patterns. Some test patterns are for warping and convergence and alignment. And the rest of the test patterns are for either white level, color, or black level. Interesting enough, the grid and warping alignment is the fastest of all of it. There you go, 55 seconds. Let's store this in PC slot one. And it looks very good. I'm sitting less than 10 feet away and the overlap is meticulous. There's some soft spots in terms of focus because I am using the 0.38 lenses, but all in all, it's actually perfectly aligned and I cannot see any of the blend zone or overlap. So this page is giving us further settings that we can control. Like we can enable the brightness control gain and the light output. I'm going to leave them default because it's all defaulted in the projector currently. For color matching, if we leave it set to auto, the camera and software will color match the two projectors together and I believe it uses a lowest common denominator type of algorithm to bring everything down to a nice clean level that matches. If we choose target setting, this doesn't work with stacking projectors but in a blend it does, we can specify one projector and then it will do its best to make the other projector match the one that's in red. 
in doing this, Projector 2 may not have the ability to reach the color spectrum of Projector 1. So this may not be as accurate, but if you dial one projector in manually and you're going to match the rest of them to that, this is a good way to go. So let's leave it on auto and start it up. I think I'll fast forward through some of this, just speed it up. This is quite a long process. All right, adjustment completed. That took about three minutes. You might have seen some of the rainbow or the rolling. I am using single chip projectors. These are the RZ770s. So they are capable of doing all of this, but there is a little artifacting between the refresh rate of the camera versus the spin wheel and the refresh rate of the projectors. So now that it's done, what we can do is we can look at our test patterns. So let's throw up a nice secondary such as cyan. Give the camera a second to auto adjust. So this is the after adjustment. You can see it on the other window. And if I check them before, it should turn off the color matching for that color. And you can see the before. Kind of hard to tell, but what this does is let you step through everything and look at it before and after comparison. Before we move on to black level, let's take a look at a couple different colors. We're on cyan, let's proceed to yellow, and just see how it performs and how they match. I know we're using sort of a consumer grade camera, here's blue, but it can still see and tell the difference if the colors were truly off. White looks fantastic, I can see the blend zone just a little bit. And here's our horizontal color bars. I'll leave it up for a second. All right, this is telling us the settings and how they're currently set. That's fine. All right, black level adjustment is going to begin. There we have it, there's our black level. It did an okay job. It's honestly not great, I can see some of the margin, but once again, I'm not shooting onto a correct surface and there is a good amount of ambient light in this room. But let's compare it to the before and after. 
there's the before, there's the after. I could see it much more in person <laughs> versus on the camera. With the rainbow roll in the low light, it's really hard for this camera to detect the difference in the black level. It's reapplying our content. It's loading our software back up. I can go into geometry now, and I can see the geometry that has been done on each projector to create this nice clean warp look. And over here you can see it did do an aggressive warp on the left side. This side is the wall, right? I just had pixels shooting off of the screen and it warped this in. But it warped this in to compensate for the overlap that I forced based on the aspect ratio of the screen and in my software. And let's throw up some content and see how it looks. Here's a nice image stretched across and I'll throw a pip right on top. Clear that pip. Throw up a new image. There you go. It looks good. It looks very good. Back to our target so you can see in detail the patterns. Now after you have content up and everything is done, sometimes you need adjustment, especially on screens and surfaces. We all know that on show site and in venues, things change temperatures affect the flux and shape of our services. So we can still come in here and our software and our GUI and adjust our individual points to tweak and tighten up that warp a little bit further. We could also rerun the auto warp plugin for just geometry and edge blending. It's a great utility and a great piece of software that's surprisingly affordable. It can save you a lot of time on your setups and your shows, especially given that you can still come in and manually save and affect everything from Geometry Manager Pro. That's it for the auto adjustment plugin. Thank you for watching.